What is going on, guys? Welcome to Fightful uh, Movie Club. My name is Rob Wilkins, along with Gisberto Guzzo, and our special guest today is none other than Royce Isaacs. Royce, thanks for joining us today, and thank hey, you, thank, for choosing thank you guys for having me. No, oh, no problem. Th thank you for choosing Training Day, man. I love this movie, so I am excited to talk about it. Excellent. Yeah, no, it's like in my like Mount Rushmore of movies. I watch it's my like comfort movie. I watch it whenever it's on a plane. Like, yeah, that's my movie. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. So uh before we get into training day, uh one thing we kind of like to ask our guests is um were you always a movie fan growing up? And uh if so, did you have any any favorites, ones that you would rewatch over and over? Um, let's see, I definitely uh hmm. I guess I feel like I did actually watch a lot of movies growing up because it would be like my me, what me and my dad would just kind of do on our downtime. And uh, he always, as a kid, I watched a lot of like Akira Kurosawa flicks and like the uh, and spaghetti westerns and stuff like that. Um, and then I, I feel like as an adult, I've gotten into a lot more like film noir and uh, like darker, grimy movies and such. But I... I like a little bit of variety for sure. Like I'm a little bit all over the place. I am a little bit disillusioned with a lot of uh, modern cinema where like, I'll see like a stupid like nineties teen movie. And I'm like, that's actually like written better than a lot of the stuff that is coming out today. And it's crazy to me, but uh, maybe that's also just me like being nostalgic about things from the nineties. I don't know. I think, I think you have a, a bit of a point. I think the last 10 years, has been pretty hit and miss with movies. I've sort of found the same thing. So I, I don't think you're alone in that. There there are still some great movies being released, but I feel yeah. like in the 90s, we did kind of have that sort of mid-budget, like adult drama that they're really not making too much of anymore. For sure. Uh, so based on your like career, did you... you uh, wow, pretty easy for me to talk. Training mm -hmm. Day is one of your favorite movies. Was there any like influence, like on your in your career, like with this movie or any movies? Did you have it like any influences as far as like character goes or anything like that? Um, I don't think for Training Day specifically, but definitely, especially early on in my career, I would say um, another one of my favorite all time movies is Big Trouble Little China, and uh, Jack Burton was like definitely like a heavy character influence or. Um, the OG original um, Mortal Kombat, I felt like Johnny Cage's character in that, being that kind of like sarcastic anti-hero, uh, was always really fun. Um, and I think the, like probably a little bit less so now, but definitely early on in my career, I feel like that's kind of where I took uh, a lot of my character work from. Very cool. That's, that's awesome. Um, so, yeah, as we move into training day, uh, I guess just generally speaking, before we get into the specifics, what is it about the movie that you love and kind of keeps you coming back to it over and over? So I think, I mean, at this point, it's just such a nostalgic trip for me where I remember every little scene and it's like, hey, they're doing the thing, they're doing the thing. But what originally got me so much about it was it's it's such an interesting um, it's like one of the best examples, I think, if you're a wrestler to watch for faces and heels, because they do a really good job of having the ultimate baby face, Ethan Hawke, and the ultimate heel, Denzel Washington. Um, and they do it in a way where Ethan Hawke is, is the ultimate white meat baby face, but I don't think he ever really comes off as like a corny, come on guys, white meat baby face. Like he is someone that you genuinely root for even through a 2024 lens where every single hero has to be kind of edgy and uh, has to have all these sarcastic remarks and whatever. He is like a really good example of, he is just a pure baby face, but he's still the guy that you root for and the guy that you like. And Denzel, while being the ultimate heel is also just a very interesting character that you kind like you, you kind of want to like him, but you just know that you can't because he is, such an embodiment of evil and then so many of the other characters that are layered in that are um like various levels of are they a good guy are they a bad guy are they kind of a 
good guy in a bad situation? Are they chaotic neutral? What's their deal? And so I think it's a really good uh, character study. And I do think it's also just really well written. All the little callbacks, all the little things that are weaved, the themes that are weaved throughout. It's uh, probably like David Ayer is the writer. And I think it's probably yes. his best, his best writing because he was a little bit confined because he wasn't directing. And I do like some of his movies that he's directed, but I think you see in some of his later works, he's almost got a little bit too much freedom and kind of certain, certain things of certain movies go off the wall or they don't hit. And in that one, because he was just doing the writing and he had someone else kind of uh, directing and maybe forming it a little bit. I think it's just like it, it melds together really, really well um, and makes a classic movie. Yeah, I think uh, I think you made a great point about the Ethan Hawke's character Hoyt. He is that white meat baby face, but he can't be too corny because Denzel is so charming that you need him to be likable for Denzel to actually work as a villain. Because if you're just rooting for his character the entire time and you don't care about Hoyt, then the movie doesn't work as well as it does. Absolutely. Also, I'm sorry, my dog is sometimes oh. he, he likes to give his take. Hey, Gimlet, come here. <laughs> let me. Uh, I, I I agree with you. So let me grab him real quick, so he doesn't uh, keep interrupting. Oh, Gimlin, um, you're trying to be the star of the show. Uh, I'm waiting for my night, everyone. To the exact same hey. thing. Oh. <laughs> huh. Hey, Gimlin. And your point about um, uh, sorry, the the David Ayer, also interesting too, because he had some other uh, movies that he wrote that everyone would know, like Fast and the Furious. The first one he wrote that. And then he would write um, End of Watch with uh, Jake Gyllenhaal and Michael Pena, yeah. which is another really good cop movie. And then probably yeah. most uh, famously uh, Suicide Squad, which had uh, tons of studio interference and didn't really go his way. So, yeah, sure. he's he's definitely hit and miss. For sure. I think End of Watch is a really good one, too, although like super depressing and sad. But that's a, that's a really good movie. And he clearly has a very – one of his biggest – like he always – tends to go back to uh, Los Angeles police department and Los Angeles crime is definitely, he always kind of ends up going back there with one of his movies before too long. Yeah. And I don't, I think you guys can probably speak to this better than I could. And just in my research on it, uh, Antoine Fuqua, who was the director of the movie, he stated that uh, the emergence of the Rampart scandal in the late nineties kind of, sped up the completion of the film and then Denzel Washington uh, kind of grew a beard to help uh, emulate the appearance of Rafael Perez, an LAPD narcotics officer who was involved in multiple scandals. I don't, in Canada, I don't really have too much knowledge of this. So I don't know if you guys can, can speak to any of that or uh, kind of how it affected the movie. It, you know, I don't really recall well, that being, um, I don't really recall that name, to be honest with you. Um, I, so i i don't I don't recall that being a part of this. So uh, maybe maybe you do, Royce, but I, I just don't recall. So I was a kid, so I it's not something that I specifically remember at the time. I do, gosh, maybe a couple of years ago, I do remember watching a like a YouTube video that was talking about that. Scandal. I don't think they had connected the two, um, the movie to uh, the scandal in the video, but that actually does make sense. And I know that, you know, LAPD has had issues, even in the more recent history with like, um, like sheriff's departments having gangs and stuff like that. Like, I know it's kind of um, a common uh, issue that the department has had. So, um, I mean, I think it's all relevant stuff, even if it is obviously uh, highly fictionalized in, in this movie and whatever. It, I, it is an interesting theme to me, and it's an interesting thing to look at. And, like, the general idea of corruption of power is always uh, something that should be examined. And is, it's an interesting so something to explore, I feel like. Yeah. Um, yeah, that, now I'm very curious to learn more about it. Uh, but just to go over like some random facts about the movie before we like get into the scenes, uh, this was Antoine, uh, uh, Fuqua. Antoine's, yeah, Fuqua, one of 
in my opinion, his best movie that he's directed. But it's he's directed. He's one. Of, he's my one of my favorite directors. He's directed so many great action movies. The first movie he directed is, in my opinion, and I don't use the term often, but it's a very underrated movie. It's the Replacement Killers with Chow Yun Fat and Mira Sorvino. Absolutely love that movie. It is just action packed. And then he's done movies like Shooter with Mark Wahlberg. Uh, a lot of people don't know this, but he was actually the music director for the video Gangsta's Paradise with Coolio. Uh -huh. cool. So just some random cool things like that. But uh, just things like that. Just I like knowing the history of where people come from when it comes to this stuff. Ethan Hawke was, uh, received a lot of critically acclaimed work for this role. or uh, per, He got a lot of recognition uh, for his work in this role he did and that was something that he, this was kind of like one of his he's done studio features before but this was where it seemed like more people were watching him where he was i mean denzel had obviously the screen presence but a lot of people got to see him in a way that this was kind of like a breakout role for him in a way so that was pretty pretty cool like that the Movie had a forty-five million dollar budget. It did over seventy-six million dollars in the United States. Um, it was pushed back because of nine eleven. Um, but those are, I mean, those are a couple of things that um, that stick out. And Denzel Washington won the Oscar, of course, for Best Actor, which is deservedly so. So, but. yeah. So I guess kind of. Moving on to Denzel, uh, yeah, he did win the Oscar that year. He beat out uh, Russell Crowe, Sean Penn, Will Smith, uh, so Tom Wilkinson, so some big names. Um, so as far as Denzel goes, do you kind of consider this his his most iconic role? Because I know there's maybe an argument to be had that maybe it's Alchem Max, maybe it's uh, maybe it's he got game. There's there's a few other ones. Maybe it's not the best movie of his, but. I feel like if anyone's ever doing like a Denzel Washington impression, it's Denzel from Training Day. Uh, I don't know. What, what do you think of his performance and kind of where does it stack up for you in terms of his all-time uh, great performances? I would say it's my personal favorite, um, which is tough because Denzel does have like, I mean, he has bangers. If you go through his, his whole filmography, he has – so many hits. You can put him up there with any of the greatest actors in terms of like how many damn good movies you can watch. I think um, probably my second favorite Denzel movie, uh, and it's a little more uh, rare, it's called uh, Devil in a Blue Dress, mm -hmm. and it's him and Don Cheadle. It's a film noir, and that movie's phenomenal too. But I would put Training Day just, a, just barely edging it out. Yeah, and uh, so there was a uh... Uh, reports before the the movie came out that there was talks with uh, uh, some other actors to play the role. So they had uh, talks with Will Smith. They had talks with Samuel Jackson. I don't know. Can you actually see this movie with anyone but him? Because he has this this charisma, this sort of down to earth quality. Whereas I'm not sure Will Smith could actually pull it off. I think just in general, Denzel's a better actor. But Will Smith's great in these roles, like. Ali where you kind of need that sort of larger than life swagger but I don't think he pulls off training day and I think Denzel actually makes a lot of Will Smith movies better if you were to reverse roles so I don't know could you see anyone else but him kind of play this role it's 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 become so iconic just all his quotes his mannerisms everything I I, I can't see I can't see anyone but him you know I I could see an alternate world where Samuel L. Jackson could pull it off. I don't think it would be as good. I think it would be really good still. I don't know if it would be like, a, this is one of my all-time favorite movies. I got to rewatch it. It might just be like, that was a really good movie. I enjoyed that. But uh, Samuel L. Jackson's phenomenal. Will Smith, I think, would be a little bit tougher because I don't think his personality would have fit quite as well. I'm sure he would have pulled it off decent. Uh, but I would probably put him third in terms of uh, ranking those three for this specific role. Um, but I, I agree with your assessment, basically. Is yeah, and there's a there's interesting. So before Antoine Fuqua came on to direct, there was a David 
Davis Guggenheim was kind of slated to do it. And he had originally wanted uh, Matt Damon as Hoyt and Samuel Jackson as Alonzo. And then once he left the project, there was uh, Denzel came on, but then there was also talks for the Hoyt character. They made an offer to Eminem, but he turned it down to do <laughs> eight mile, which is a crazy wow. sort of sliding doors moment in history. Could you imagine yeah. if like Eminem had not done eight mile or even if he had just sort of pursued acting in general, every time I see him yeah. in a movie, I think he's actually pretty good. Like he was in, um, yeah. I don't know if, did you ever see uh, I think it was called funny people. The one with Adam Sandler where he has cancer and he gets better. He has like a cameo in that movie where he's really that funny. Cameo is hilarious. That cameo is yeah. freaking hilarious. It's the only part of that movie I remember. Yeah. Yeah. And then some of the other names they had was like Toby Maguire, Paul Walker, Freddie Prince Jr. So kind of those late nineties, early two thousands names that you always heard. But yeah, Ethan, I Ethan don't talk is I just don't, great. I, I agree. I think it ended up perfectly how it should have been. I do think in some weird way, I don't think it would have been as good. I do think Eminem would have done a decent job because I do think he could kind of embody. He's good at that kind of like, um, like ponderous look of self doubt that kind of Hoyt has throughout like a lot of it. Yeah. I think he would have been a little bit different, but I think he would have done well. I think Paul Walker probably would not have had the range. I think he, Paul Walker yeah. was perfect for fast and the furious where he just has to kind of be too cool for school and whatever. I don't think he would have been perfect for Hoyt. Um, Toby Maguire. I don't, I think he would have came off too goofy and corny. I don't think he would have been a good Hoyt. Yeah. And uh, was there any other one? A little bit of that. Uh, Ryan, uh, Freddie Prince Jr., Ryan Philippe, and those that was mm. kind of the list. But he, he Hoyt has to be, like you said, he, ha he has to be lovable, but he also has to be kind of tough and able to kind of handle himself. And early 2000, mm -hmm. Tobey Maguire, I, yeah, I, I agree. I think he's just a little too, I don't know, he just comes off kind of soft. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. I think Ryan Philippe, uh, I like Ryan Philippe. He's in Way of the Gun, which I think is a great movie. Uh, I don't think I once again don't think he would have had the right range for Hoyt specifically. I don't think he would have had quite the right character and range. Uh, Freddie Prinz is interesting um, since he might own a wrestling company one day. I'm going to say he would have done the best job. It would have been the greatest movie. So if he's watching, you know, you're my guy. No, I think Ethan Hawke was the right choice overall. I think he he did that role so well, and he just has the right. I think he's a great actor, and I think he. He was like made for that role. Yeah. And before I, before I hand it back to Rob, he knows one of my favorite things to do is to kind of go back and relitigate the Oscars years after the fact. Mm -hmm. And yeah, Ethan Hawke was nominated for best supporting actor. He doesn't win. These were the other nominees, Ben Kingsley, sexy beast, Ian McKellen, Lord of the Rings, fellowship of the ring, John Voight, Ali, which is ridiculous. He's in like, two minutes of that movie and um jim broadbent in iris do you know who won the oscar that year it was <sighs> jim broadbent in iris <laughs> i was gonna say only because that was the one i was like least familiar with of course he, he won it yeah hmm. how does ethan hawk not win this oscar i'm trying to think of all the people that have been in movies with denzel washington there's maybe like two or three where you can say they actually held their own and reached his level. Like what you Tom Hanks in Philadelphia, maybe I don't really love that movie. Uh, Viola Davis and fences. Uh, maybe that might be it. <laughs> I, I would say uh, Don Cheadle and devil in a blue dress. Oh yeah. So, but that's, that's it. That's the three, you know? Yeah. So yeah. I don't know how he doesn't win that Oscar. That's just, that's just nonsense to me. Yeah, that's criminal. That's criminal. I would have, I would have thought they would have just given it to like Ian McCallan or something. It's like okay, that's like a big blockbuster. I get it. You do your whatever, but like if you're not going to go with him. You, Ethan Hawke, far and away did the best job out of all of those people in that category. Yeah, and and I think Rob, you'd agree. Like Denzel deserved his. He probably should have won it for Malcolm X. This almost felt like he had to win it at some point here, and. I mean, you had Russell Crowe for A Beautiful Mind, Sean Penn for I Am Sam, uh, Will Smith for Ali, and Tom Wilkinson in the bedroom. So, I mean, it was Denzel's to lose, but he probably should have had his Oscar like 10 years earlier. <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, yeah, because Malcolm X, Malcolm X was 1992, I believe. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, but yeah, that's very interesting. Uh, well, we already talked about the director and the the writer. Uh, so, what are your? Do you have like a favorite scene uh, or favorite scenes or like quotes in this in Training Day? I mean, there's a lot. So it's. I mean, there, there is, is a lot. Out? The most of them all down. We're gonna go through every single one. <laughs> Be yeah, like movie over. Okay, good. Because yeah, it it is really hard to pick one scene or one quote. Uh, I think off the top of my head, what I would go with without thinking about it too much. Favorite scene is um, the part where he's playing cards with the Mexican gangbangers. I think that's like an all time, and um, I think. For quotes, uh, you know, Denzel's last little, like, um, fire-up spot at the end where, you know, uh, I'll put cases on all you. You'll be playing basketball at Pelican Bay. King Kong ain't got shit on me. You just live here. I run shit here. Like, that's that's amazing. That's, that's, that and, like, uh, it's not what you know. It's what you can prove that keeps going mm. throughout the whole movie that are, like, stick out to me. Yeah, and the King Rob Kong Eddie. part was uh, ad lib too. They said, "So really, yeah, Woo. that's that a hell of an ad lib." That's. I also I, in the the card scene, I always pop for the fact that one of the gangbangers is uh, the guy that ends up playing Tuco Salamanca on Breaking Bad, yeah. which I didn't obviously at the time. It's not a thing. And then when I rewatch it, I'm like, oh my god, there's Tuco! Like, whoa! Oh, that's, oh man, I didn't. I didn't realize that now until you said that. So that's awesome. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I guess we'll we'll start uh, from the beginning. I have uh, five scenes written down. I, I made like a top five list. So for me, uh, their first meeting when they're at the diner, the whole tell me yeah. a story scene. I think yeah. that's absolutely incredible. Denzel's just like, all right, you won't let me read my paper. Tell me a story. And then... <laughs> Ethan Hawke tells him the story about the drunk, uh, uh, the drunk stop. He's like, you telling me you've been on patrol with a fine woman for this long. And the best story you have is about, uh, about a drunk stop. And then he does the whole thing. He's like, I get my entertainment from this This is 90% bullshit. You won't let me read it. So you entertain me. That whole scene, I think is just lights out. Yes. Yes. And you see, like when you rewatch it, if you've watched it before and you rewatch it, it's such a good uh, like setup scene for where you kind of see why he's able to have such a uh, influence and control over Ethan Hawke for so much of the movie because it's like a classic way to manipulate people where you kind of ha- he always has him on the back foot. He's always having Ethan Hawke kind of like, oh, reacting like, oh, no, I don't want to upset the big boss that's like in charge of if I can make lieutenant and if I can make detective and whatever. Like he it's such a good that and then obviously every everything that happens after continues this trend, but it like it just sets the scene for how layered in of why does this guy go along with all this stuff or why does it take him so long to realize, whoa, things aren't what they seem. I think it's very relatable to be in a situation where something isn't quite what you thought it was, but you're going into it with the mindset of like, oh, this is going to be a good thing for me. This is going to, you know, I could get this promotion. This could change my life. This is the guy that I have to like listen to. And then when you look back on it years later, you're like, man, this guy sucked. He, he clearly didn't have my best interest at heart, whatever. But it, it's such a like relatable human type of thing. I think it's a great scene. And I obviously like the little anecdote at the beginning, all that is it's, it's really good. The way it's written, everything about it. Um, yeah, no, that's a great scene for sure. Yeah. And uh, actually, even just before that scene, I was I wanted to mention and I completely forgot how do you feel about those opening few minutes with Ethan Hawke and his wife? She's kind of showing his family. I always thought it was a little bit slow. I understand the purpose because you need to know what's on, what's on the line for him, what he's coming home to at the end of the day. But at the same time, I also wish there was like a bit of a prequel scene showing Alonzo in Las Vegas, getting in trouble with the Russians, killing the person just because there's the whole story with like Alonzo, the Russians, the three wise men that I feel like there's just like a great story there that maybe they didn't tap into as much as I would have liked, but uh, yeah, I don't know. How how do you feel about that? 
That is interesting. And off the top, you mentioning that, it does sound like something that would be good uh, for the movie. I think hmm. there is something, though, that I like about how it's put together that you don't. I think that might give away too much that Alonzo is this bad guy, that Alonzo is uh, in the wrong and that things aren't what they seem. And I kind of like that it's a little bit vague and you start to get little hints and little hints and you don't really realize until whatever, halfway through you're like, oh, this guy is just fully corrupt. And he's, Mm -hmm. there's no like, oh, actually he's doing it still for the right reason. He is the protecting the lambs or whatever he says. Um, So I don't know. It it would be interesting to see like a director's cut where they, they did something like that, but maybe overall it's, it was done the correct way. But maybe, maybe not. Rob, how do you feel about that? No, I, I, I was just going back thinking about it, and it's the, as far as like the opening scene. I I see exactly your point with like the family part. I I like how they did that because it makes sense in the end. What he what he gets to go back home to. As far as like if they would have gone back to show like the Vegas stuff, I think Royce is right. It might have kind of I don't want to say over like overdo it, but it might have played a little bit too much for me. Um, that's maybe there's I'm... a maybe there's like a ten episode Netflix series in the future just showing like how Alonzo got this way. I would love that. Yes, absolutely. I'm in. It. Yeah, I'm in for it for sure. Uh, all awesome. right. Fantastic. Uh, the next scene, uh, I have is just really anything with, uh, Scott Glenn, the retired cop, uh, him at the beginning getting, uh, uh, Hoyt is introduced to him. And then at the end, when they end up killing him, they find the money under his floorboards. They sort of coordinate the whole story that they're going to tell the cops. I have some maybe questions in logic regarding that scene, but I, I think the whole thing is set up so great. I also just love like the tiny detail that this guy is a retired cop, right? And he just knows this guy who played high school football maybe 10, 15 years earlier. He's like, oh yeah, defensive back, right? It's like he just remembers every kid who played high school football from that area, which is just fantastic. But um yeah, I don't know. A- any thoughts on on the scenes with uh Scott Glenn and them robbing him and kind of coordinating the whole story um so one yeah scott glenn is great in that um i think uh first of all i love i also have to really quick go back to i love the scene of him forcing hoyt uh to get high denzel forcing hoyt to get high that i don't know you like to get wet is a great lead (laughs) into that and then this kid's higher than shit or whatever as scott glenn says when he comes in uh i think the story that he tells like the the joke that he tells uh, about like the snail and the mm-hmm. fuck's your problem is really funny and really interesting. And especially when you start, if you start to later ki- kind of try to break that joke down and once you understand that joke, you'll understand how policing works or whatever. It's like, okay, that is, even if you don't necessarily view policing that way or policing in LA or whatever, quite that way through the lens of this movie, at least you kind of get, okay, this is what they're getting at, or this is what that, uh, could be interpreted as, which I think is a really vital and important piece. Um, I do actually somewhat understand or relate to the, like the old dude that just happened to follow the good high school football players. I went yeah. to a really big high school that, um, like in, in Colorado, we were always like in the running for the, the state championship or whatever. And like our stadium would have, I mean, like 4,000 people, 10,000 people for big games or whatever, you know, on a weekly basis. And we had a big high school, but a lot of those people were not like related to anyone on the field. They were just like, we want to see, you know, high level high school football. And there would be people that would just know, oh, hey, that's so and so. They're the all state running back. That's so and so. They're going to West Virginia next year on a full ride. So I actually, I thought that was like a super. Uh, I was like, oh, yeah, like I, I know, you know, I, I remember 10 people like that that were, you know, watching my high school football games or whatever. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I think I do agree. There's probably if you really analyze the later scene 
their plan. There are some small holes in whatever their plan would be and whether they would be able to get away with it. But I guess the general idea is that there's overall corruption so that they would only need to really cover up certain slight things about it. Um, and so it doesn't, it, it never like takes me out of the movie where I'm like, oh, that's too much of a jump. And I'm like, not believe, like I'm not believing the world you're creating or whatever. Yeah. And I think the way it's written is um, done in a way too, where they leave enough kind of clues and crumbs that explains why things might be happening this way rather than, yeah. Because if they didn't tell the story in the way they did, you might just be wondering, well, why doesn't he just take that money and leave town like immediately? So, yeah. and yeah, you actually mentioned the, uh, the Denzel bullying Ethan Hawke into smoking the PCP. That was, that was next on the list. I, oh, bro, I had beautiful. Out of order. oh my God. That's such a great scene. I love when he stops in the middle of the road and that guy's like honking and he just pulls out the gun. <laughs> yes. That's just yeah. Like, it's, that, that part is a little bit. You're like, whoa, whoa. Like definitely now when I rewatch that, that's one of the, the parts that I'm like, all right, that's a little bit almost takes me out of it. But it's like I, it's part of the Denzel character. It's necessary. Yeah. The whole scene's great. Him tricking him into smoking P, uh, Hoyt into smoking PCP. Like it is a, uh, it's a it's a classic scene. And then you have like the whole he's like kind of tripping yeah. and you all the visuals. Yeah, it's. I, and I don't. Yeah. I didn't know you like to get wet. Is like an all time. That's, that's a hilarious line that you just out of context is okay. I get it. <laughs> uh, yeah, that and oh, yeah, we're gonna get to the poker scene. There's a couple. There's another couple great lines there too. Which some of these lines I don't even feel like comfortable saying them on camera. But sure, yeah, sure. We're we're gonna get there. Um, oh my gosh. Um, then we get to. Uh, Hoyt um, stopping the two crackheads from from raping the girl, and then it's there you kind of get a, a better idea of sort of Denzel's worldview. Uh, he kind of says it in the car too, you know, like um, these people live outside the law, and if you want to catch them, that's sort of where you have to operate as well. And um, they track down Snoop Dogg, who's actually pretty good in this movie, uh, much better than uh, I think it was Dr. Dre who has a scene later on when he's yeah. part of the crew. Yay, not doing too great. Um, yeah, then the, the poker scene. I mean, it it's just fantastic. You have the, the great lines of them asking Hoyt, uh, you like being a pig? And he's like, I should have been a fireman. That's yes. such a great line. Uh, they asked him, have you ever had your shit pushed in? Again, have really you hilarious. Shit pushed in? Yeah. yeah. Bane's all one popping in their neck. Crazy. Yes. The one friend. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, uh, the guy that, that ends up playing Tuco, and he's like, you've had the shit pushed in. I had my shit pushed in. And then the, uh, one of the other guys is the guy, Hector, who plays Hector in like 10 movies. I don't know if you've ever like done the deep dive on his IMDb, but he's literally just credited as Hector in like 10 different movies. Like someone screenshotted it, and it's become a, a little bit of a meme, but literally yep. he plays a character named Hector in so many movies. It's, it's hilarious. No, oh, I have, I have to go up. look that up. <laughs> You know, yeah, now I'm like, I have to see this now. Um, yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Um, with with, with the uh, uh, the stuff with the uh, them stopping the crackheads and then the poker scene, I guess that kind of ties together. Are you okay with the fact that like it was their cousin that he found the wallet that then that saves him from being? Is that like a bit too like uh, um, uh, overly coincidental, or it, at that point do we just go with it? Because I mean, like. At this point, there's a lot of stuff just happening in this one day as it is. Yeah, it is like the most stressful 24 hours of all time, probably. But I think you're allowed like one deus ex machina like that in a movie that's that good. And I think um, it, it makes sense because they do. It is such a pivotal scene early on that it would be a little bit like it's not like they didn't do their due diligence. Like he does pick up the ID and there's an acknowledgement on camera of, you know, him seeing it and oh, she's only 16 or 14 or whatever he says. Um, so it's not like, it's not like that's never acknowledged. And then all of a sudden he has the ID on her or they just call, happened to call her. And it was like, they did at least enough of the groundwork. It is definitely, obviously, uh, like I said, a deus ex machina, but I think you're allowed one. You're allowed one in a movie that's that good. Um, 
I, yeah, the crackhead scene's really good, and and it's so stressful when they in the later scene when they have him in the tub and they have the shotgun to him and they're about to do him, and it's like, is this gonna go down right now? They call her up, and she, hey, no, tell me for real, what happened? You go straight to school? Like, is it's like really stressful, but in the best way. Also, actually, really quick, I did want to go back. Like some things that I think I didn't notice when I was like a kid and I watched the movie that you then realize what's going on later is Alonzo's bringing them these blenders or whatever, like these uh, appliances, which is obviously just dirty money. And then you realize when he's leaving him there now, it's like, oh, he's paying them for a hit. He's giving them money to kill because they wouldn't just kill Hoyt for no reason. Why? They're not just like, oh, let's just kill a random cop that would probably look bad or whatever. But he's doing this delivery, obviously, to give them a job. Like, hey, here's here's all this money. Take care of my problem. Yeah, I I agree. Uh, and then I, at first, I I always wondered, like, would the would the gang members actually not go through with the hit because he saved the cousin, or would they just make it like a slightly less painful or gruesome death? But I think. Uh, I think it does work. I think uh, uh, there's there's something about like family and that sort of being a priority over money, which then you again you see that again in the later scene where the community all comes together and they basically tell them, you know, fuck you, we don't need you, we don't need your support, your money, or anything. We're a community. You're not part of this community. And then also Jake, you know, with his wife. So I think there's like this really kind of nice kind of underlying story about family within this movie as well, too. Sure. And I think it's, there's also a bit of the social commentary of, you know, yes, these people are gangsters, but they still do have a code. And Mm -hmm. even earlier on, um, uh, OG bone, um, the guy that later is like, no, you got you got to put on your own work and puts down the gun for uh, Alonzo. He says like, like Alonzo, when Alonzo walks past him, they have that little oh, thanks for what you did for my cousin. He goes, man, I don't trust that guy. He has no, he he doesn't have a code or he doesn't have morals or something. Yeah. He says something basically along the lines of he doesn't have that that line. Whereas you see repeatedly the commentary is that the gangsters, while they are gangsters, they do terrible things. They will do hits for money. They will sell drugs. They will whatever. They still have a street code that they stick to. And that's what sets them apart from someone like an Alonzo. Mm -hmm. Um, I did look and Hector has eight credits under the eight (laughs) credits as Hector. That's a wild. Yeah. He's played Hector eight, eight times. So (laughs) Rob, do you mind my asking while you have that up there? Is there any, um, any other like really notable movies? that it happened in or is training day kind of the most uh the most notable one where you where you played hector or yeah uh, i yeah. no, you he played heck uh well he played hector in uh fast and the furious but in training oh. day his i don't know they well so on imdb they have his name as um oh what was it i just had it right here uh they had his name as But like the other the other movies where he's Hector, are any of them uh, uh, like big titles? So I guess you said no. Fast and the Furious. Oh, Fast and the know. Furious is probably the biggest one. He was on Fresh biggest Off one. the Boat, that TV show. Um, mm-hmm. But other than that, it's it's the Fast and the Furious movies. All the other ones are like minor ones. Oh, okay, so, interesting. So, yeah, um, yeah. So then I guess that that brings us to the 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 final, not final scene, but the uh, the fight between. Uh, Hoyt and Alonzo, which kind of happens in the apartment, then it spills out onto the rooftop and then out onto the street. I just think that's one of like the great fight scenes that kind of I've ever watched because there's so much tension. You genuinely hate Alonzo by this point in the movie. You feel so bad for Hoyt. I mean, we're going to come back to like just running down his day. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, I don't know. A- any thoughts on that whole fight? Um, the way it ends? Uh, do you think? Alonzo actually gets to walk out of that community uh, unharmed the way he did. Um, so obviously if this was like a, like a more realistic movie, I think the obvious thing is that the gangsters just turn on him and actually do him in. But I think 
that would mess with their narrative of them kind of having more morals than him and how it Hoyt says you're wrong. They're not like you or whatever. So they have to kind of have it that way. And it also to tie in uh, the storyline with the Russians is like, they, they do want to have this overarching theme of eventually the karma does get Alonzo. And that's kind of the best way for that to happen. Um, I agree. It's a, it's a really good fight scene from when they start out and they're shooting at each other. And, uh, Jay Coit ends up being the one that saves the, his own kid, uh, uh, saves Alonzo's kid, and then they're on a balcony off a rooftop. They're tumbling around. I think it's well shot too, where like, uh, you know, because this isn't, it's not like a like a like an action movie uh, per se. You know, it's like they're they're not having to do all these extra cuts and this stuff. It's not supposed to be just like it's not like a kung fu fight. You know what I mean? Right. It's not like a current movie where every fight scene, no matter what, just has all these fast cuts here and there and you can barely tell what's going on it's supposed to show this like just two grown men tumbling over each other and fighting and it's a little bit messy and it's scrappy and you can just kind of watch it and see it but it's still stressful it's frenetic there's a lot of movement they're falling off of stuff over stuff all this stuff is happening um and then it obviously ends up with them in the streets with all the gangsters kind of coming out and the community coming out as well and being like whoa what's happening and that's where like all the magic at the end with, you know, now nah, you got to put in your own work. Now nah, they ain't like you, the King Kong ain't got shit on me. All that stuff happens there. And it's, it's such a great climax to the movie. Um, and then obviously also, in addition to the, the gangsters, not popping Alonzo having uh, Hoyt have that moment. It's like, the, it's like that moment in um, a match where the heels been cheating, 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 cheating. And then the face is like, screw this. And they grab the championship belt to hit the heel. And then they go, oh, I can't do that. You know what I mean? Like, it's like such an ultimate baby face moment of I'm not going to stoop to your level. You know, I'm going to let the Russians, the other bad guys kind of take care of you because I know that's right. what happens when I take this evidence in kind of thing. Yeah. And to your point, uh, I think this is actually like a really well shot movie. You mentioned that it, it does feel very modern, even though it is 22 years old. If you watch it today, you wouldn't think that. There's a lot of movies from like the late 90s and early 2000s. When you watch them now, they look very old and very dated. Whereas this one, the yeah. way it's shot, the way Antoine Fuqua um, shoots it, it it does still come off as like a very modern movie, which I think is a, a real testament to it. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's well shot. It's well lit. Um, yeah, and it still has stuff that's relevant, I think, in a current time. Yeah. Um, I'm just going to run through some of the other quotes that uh, I had written down here just because I don't want to miss any of them. Uh, yeah, so we'd mentioned I, – I don't know why. I wrote them in like an order of like my favorite to least favorite instead of <laughs> chronologically, which I'm realizing now was a real stupid idea. But uh, <laughs> uh, we got King Kong ain't got shit on me. Uh, we got uh, – to protect the sheep, you got to catch the wolf, and it takes a wolf to know to, to catch a wolf, um, which great. Um, and then we did the. Do you know any stories? Okay, I'll tell you a story. This is a newspaper. It's ninety percent bullshit. We did that. Um, you obviously mentioned didn't know you like to get wet, dog. <laughs> it's, just, <laughs> it's such a great line. Oh my god, uh, this shit's chess. It ain't checkers. Um, it's no, f and then Ethan Hawke has, uh, it's no fun when the rabbit has the gun, uh, and then he does, uh, should have been a fireman. And then a couple more from Alonzo, nothing in the, nothing's free in this world, not even arrest warrants. Um, they build jails cause of me. Uh, uh, another Denzel just imitated line was when he just keeps on boom, 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 boom. People love to do that. And then uh, it's not what you know, it's what you can prove. And uh, you got to control your smiles and cries because that's all you have and nobody can take that away from you. So that, that's what I had for, for, for my favorite uh, quotes from the movie. Any, any that stand out to you guys or any that you want to add to that list? No, I mean, it always goes back like to the King Kong one for me because that's just iconic because the way he beats his chest too, it's he you see the 
obviously the acting's top notch, but it's so believable. Like the he just boom, like it just he's passionate about it, and it. But you also see like the side where he you can tell he's also scared about what's what could happen, even though he doesn't know. You could tell, and that's I think that goes a long ways for that entire scene. Yeah, it's like you it's such a like the wounded lion roaring, you know what I mean? It's like it's still dangerous, but it's really overplaying how dangerous it is because it knows how vulnerable it is at that very moment. Mm. Yeah. Now, can I ask you guys a question? I think I just keep missing this when I'm watching the movie. When the Russians track him down and shoot him. It, did they explain how they found him or was that just like a, they were sort of tracking his car? I, I kind of missed how they, how they found him like while he was on his way out of the city or was that just, I, I just, just like, I just always took that as the Russian mafia being fairly well connected. And if they want to find you, like they, they would yeah. obviously know a lot of the places that he would be in general. Like they would know, that he had the little house in the jungle and stuff like that, uh, the, the jungle area. So, like, I'm sure they would have loosely been following him in some way so that, like, okay, he's over in this area, so when he comes out, we'll er, er, and cut him off or whatever. But, like, I, I don't know, it doesn't seem unrealistic to me that, like, especially in L.A. with, like, how some things were, like, I, uh, rest, in be, rest in peace to P&B Rock, but I don't know if you heard about that situation maybe two years ago at this point, but, like, he was at Roscoe's Chicken and Waffles, and people, uh, his location was uh, like on IG, and then within like five minutes, there were gangsters there robbing him, and he he got shot and, and killed. And so it's like if, especially if you're in tune with like um, how a lot of like gang culture and like uh, mafias and stuff like that work, it's pretty easy to. Uh, if you're not very careful about your location and whatever, if you have issues with those certain people, people are going to find you unless you're like really, really like on your, you know, minding your, your P's and Q's on that kind of stuff. So it, it doesn't take me out of it, but it is definitely like, yeah, it is just kind of out of nowhere. And I think kind of the, the I think they almost intentionally did that because they want you to think, oh, maybe he is getting away or maybe he's never going to get his comeuppance. And so it's like, they don't want to show early on someone tracking him or, anything like that. But I do think they do a good enough job, like between Alonzo being so nervous early on or um, how the three wise men are treating him and stuff like that. They do a good enough job of building up how much danger he's in that you don't just go, whoa, where did this come from? Even though it is extremely sudden, you're, you're a hundred percent right there. Yeah. As far as like that goes, as far as like the, the Russian, they don't really, show and Royce nailed it like I think that was part of it they just he owed money and they just they just kind of knew what to do you know I, I don't think they had a I don't think they followed I don't think they wanted to add to the story it wouldn't surprise me if there's like deleted scenes because I don't remember the DVD I mean I have the DVD but I don't remember if there's deleted scenes and stuff but it wouldn't surprise me if there's deleted scenes of that because you you make a good point like how did they find them? But uh, I'd be curious to know that now, but then it didn't really, it didn't really come into play for me. Yeah. Um, so I, I guess before we um, wrap up, I guess just maybe a question for, for you um, 20 years later, uh, what do you feel like kind of the legacy is with training day um, uh, and is it still relevant today? Is it more relevant even now than it was back then? I don't know. What do you think? Uh, what do you think the legacy of the film is, at least for you, anyway? Um, I think it's absolutely relevant today because uh, not just in LA, there there is uh, police corruption that will happen. Uh, you know, and you'll hear about it all over. And there is just general corruption of power, which is you know a, a central theme uh, that. Um, I think is relevant to, to anyone. I think, you know, if you're trying to do, if you're interested in like movies and how, like what makes a good guy and a bad guy, I think it's really relevant for that. I think as far as legacy goes, 
I think it's still, it, it holds up so well. Like, there's some movies that you're like, well, this is, I really liked this as a kid, but this kind of sucks now. And I think this movie holds up. Um, if not, like I appreciate it more as an adult where I can really understand everything that's going on. Um, I think Denzel's performance is one of the greatest performances of like anyone in any movie, really. It's like such an iconic uh, referenced, pop culturally referenced type of uh, movie. I think Ethan Hawke's performance, uh, as you said, kind of vaulted him into like that top tier actor uh, kind of level. And um, I mean, gosh, so many good little cameos. Um, yeah. So many actors that like then went on to do some other stuff and were, you know, more well known. Um, I think, I think as far as longevity and legacy, I think it is, is really up there. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. I, I would agree too. And my, my mom's a, a criminal uh, law enforcement uh, professor and, she she's shown this movie in her classes before um, because she thinks it plays a, a pivotal, it could play a role for like some people just to see like on the outside of how it is. I mean, she knows she obviously tells them it's a movie, but she goes, there's, there's a lot of things that you can learn, like how people talk to others and stuff like that. So um, I know that it's just hearing that like it, it's pretty interesting, but she shows a lot of different movies like for like that reason, just to show like, I mean, it's also like an entertainment thing to say, Hey, like, you know, you, we teach you all this stuff, but you also get rewarded to be able to watch a movie here and there. So there's always a lesson to it. So, uh, but yeah, the, before we let you go, I always like to ask this question. Is there anything that you watched lately that you liked, uh, anything newer or even if it's something that's older that you liked or anything you want to recommend for people to watch? Um, I just, um, I, I watched uh, killers of the flower moon, uh, which was like three and a half hours, but I was on a flight back from the UK. So I was like, I got 10 hours to kill. If I'm ever going to watch this, this is the time to do it. And, uh, even though it was over three hours, it actually didn't really feel like it. I thought it was really good, but it's also, it's really hard for me to, not enjoy Scorsese and uh, uh, DiCaprio, I think are always like a really good pairing. Um, definitely not a new movie, but uh, The Departed is on my, like one of my top movies of all time too. That's always one of my like go-to movies. Um, i trying to think of what else I've like watched recently that I really, really liked. Um, Gosh, I feel like there's a, oh uh, gosh, what was that? Um uh, uh Ryan Gosling robs a bank. Uh Bradley Cooper's in it as well. Oh, the place beyond the ferns or something? Oh, or yeah, beyond yeah. the pines. Place beyond yeah, the yeah. pines. I just watched that as well on a flight, and I really like that. It's an older movie, but I, I just yeah. saw that and that I thought that was phenomenal. Um, yeah, that's a really. Good but I feel movie. like I've already given a really good. Like you, you know what kind of movies I really like. If you yeah, like, yeah. You just heard my list of movies. <laughs> yeah, Rob, Rob. Anything? Uh, anything else that you've uh, checked out recently? Uh, no. Like the last movie I did watch was Training Day. So, uh, but I am planning on watching. Planning on going to see Dune two this weekend. So there's that. Nice. Nice. Uh, yeah, for myself. Uh, uh, on Disney Plus, I've just checked out uh, Poor Things. Uh, Emma Stone just won the uh, Oscar for for that movie, so that's that was really enjoyable. And uh, uh, today, I'm going to start uh, the new Shogun series. So, Ooh. fingers crossed. I'm hoping that is actually good. I can't recommend it yet, but uh, from everything I've heard, uh, I should be in for for a treat. Yeah, let me know if that's good because I I'm always into st- uh, content like that. So, holler at me. Yeah. Absolutely. Would and this is another question that I'm going to ask. Do you have any interest in ever like doing like movie work, like whether it's stunts or anything down the line? Uh, yeah, I would definitely be interested. Um, I've done a few little like things, like uh, I did some stuff for the last couple seasons of I Think You Should Leave, but they ended up getting cut. Um. I was on Shark Tank as an extra once. Um, I'm trying to think of what else. Oh, I was in uh, 
um, Ryan Nemeth's uh, short film. I have a little cameo in there. Um, I feel like there's probably something else I'm forgetting. Yeah, being in LA, I would love to. I actually kind of want to get into more uh, uh, voiceover work as well. I've done a little bit of that for some like the 2K games and stuff like that. So I feel like that'd be a fun route to uh, to go down. But I also, when I moved to LA, uh, probably a little bit hard headed of me, but I wanted to be so I wanted to, I didn't want to just be a wrestler that was in LA then ends up just doing a bunch of stuff in movies and kind of or goes wrestling because it's more profitable to be in movies. But I'm, I'm to the point where I feel like I'm doing really well with my career. Obviously I'd like to, to even get to uh, higher peaks and whatnot, but I think I could probably take a few, uh, hours and here and there and try to audition for some stuff and you know maybe maybe make some extra scratch and, and do some cool stuff because i i do i love movies and it would be cool to uh to be part of them it's just never something that i've like super actively pursued as much as like oh hey like this is going on i can get you a role in this or i you know this is whatever so you know maybe in the future cool cool nice. well uh do you have anything uh coming up that you would want, want people to know about uh whether it's uh promotions that you're going to be at or anything like that um my next uh, big one for new japan is going to be the windy city riot on uh april 12th i believe and then two days after that is a uh, deadlock in um uh uh raleigh north carolina um if you want to see my full schedule uh you know check out my socials at royce isaacs uh twitter and uh instagram and i, I keep uh, everyone up to date with all my stuff that's that's coming up and if you're not already checking out New Japan Strong, check out New Japan Strong. I also I have my YouTube channel where I upload uh, full matches uh, and highlights and stuff like that every once in a while. And uh, if uh, you enjoyed the uh, me bullshitting about uh, Training Day and you want to check out more of my stuff or whatever, uh, I would love for you you too. So thank you, thank you to anyone that that sat down and listened to us uh, talk about a movie for an hour because it was really fun for me. Awesome, we appreciate it, Gisberto. Yeah, no, we, I had so much fun too. Um, uh, as for me, you guys can just find me here. Uh, thank you to everyone who takes the time to listen to us. We really do appreciate it. Uh, it does mean a lot. So thank you. Guys, you can follow me at Rob Wilkins on Twitter. I am also on Instagram at Fightful Rob and on threads at Fightful Rob. I want to say thank you for joining us on Fightful Film Club. Uh, we will talk to you soon. Take care. <laughs>